Thank you so much for being here tonight. It is truly a pleasure and an honor to have the privilege to speak the gospel to you once again here today. I hope the things that I say before you is an encouragement to you and an enjoyment to you and it will take, give you something that you will hide in your hearts and be able to proclaim this uh, throughout the world when you have the opportunity. It's been a, a great day to have um, spend some time at the Marshalls, uh, maybe set for a little bit for the afternoon because because somebody just kept wanting to remind me how bad I was getting beaten fancy football, and he wouldn't let me rest. So, but I won't mention any names, Harold. But, but uh, I. But other than that, it was it was fine. Um, but that's. Yeah, I hope you know that's a joke though too. So, <laughs> but I really enjoy spending time with the Marshalls. I've had I've always had fun with them. They've been good to me. They've been good to my family, and I've just always enjoyed the opportunity uh, to spend time with them when I have the opportunity. So, thank you so much. For letting me be with you guys uh, last night and today. So, I put up Captain America here. As you recall this morning, I talked about he is my favorite superhero. And I, I bring up him because he is just a very intriguing individual. It's, it's something that America looked up to for an awfully long time. And it's because he was about truth, justice, and American way. I know that's a, a kind of a Superman cliche there, but he was just about, you know, going against the the evils of the world, primarily the uh, the uh, the axis of the Nazis and the, and the Japanese, and he was really against those. And if you ever had this particular comic book, you know that uh, that was one of the first editions that ever came out. And that edition right now goes for about three hundred thousand dollars. And uh, what's interesting about that particular comic book is there's not very many of them out there. And the reason being is because if you remember around World War II, they were recycling everything, and that included comic books. Kids were doing their duties, even with their comic books, and turning them in so they could help with the war. And the reason why I bring up this particular captain is because we look at a guy like that, and we admire some of the things that he does. Well, I would encourage you today to look at another captain. And once again, just be mindful that just because there's a picture up there doesn't mean that's the actual uh, what this individual looked like but this is Naaman the Syrian that we read there and, and as Larry read there in our scripture uh, about how Jesus reminds us about how the one that was cured particularly in, of his leprosy was Naaman the Syrian. It wasn't a Jew, it wasn't anybody from Abraham's lineage, it was this particular captain of a Syrian army. And if you ever have the opportunity, read the things that led up to him coming to this particular point. Because of all the individuals that would give him this advice to uh, get rid of his leprosy, it was a Jewish girl that was being held as a slave. And it, you would think that this individual would say, well, hopefully he just dies of his leprosy and I can just move on with my life. But she said, you need to go to Israel and you need to search out this particular prophet. And, and one of the things I find interesting in this study with, with Naaman is there's a lot of things, just like this morning, that we can reflect on and realize that we are guilty of it sometimes when it comes to the things that Naaman does also. What I want you to think about here tonight for a short period of time is maybe once again examine ourselves. And look at how Naaman wanted to do things his way, but understand later on that if he wanted something that was great, God would have told you so. And sometimes as we talked in our Bible to study this morning, when we look at certain things as great, fantastic, beautiful, good, so on and so forth in a positive perspective, we look at it in a world view, and maybe sometimes, just like we read there in the days of creation, maybe we need to look at things in God's view and ask ourselves, is it really good? So if you just follow along here tonight, and, and like I said, it'll be something I hope that will encourage us all, and, and just follow along here. One of the things I find interesting in this study here in, um, in this particular book, if you go in the Second Kings chapter 5, is he kind of goes to the wrong guy. We're all guilty of it. We think that sometimes uh, the cheapest way to go will give us the, the product that we want. Or when it comes to service, we think that if somebody does it very expensive, we'll get what we 
uh, what we desire too, and that's not necessarily the case either. And what we see here with Naaman, when he has his leprosy, the king decides to send a servant to the king of Israel and tells him, please take care of Naaman's leprosy. And you can see his response there in verse 6. Uh, or, or verse 7, it says, When the king of Israel had read the letter, he tore off his clothes to show he was sad and upset. And he says, Am I God? I don't have the power over life and death. So why did the king of Aram send a man sick with leprosy for me to heal? Think about it, and you will see that this is a trick. The king of Aram is trying to start a fight. Sometimes when you look at that particular passage, it was like, What's the purpose of this guy sending this issue to me? I can't fix this. I had a, a close friend uh, decide to go to a counselor, and I believe that he should have went to a doctor instead of a counselor. And I said, here's the reason why I believe you should go to a doctor instead of a counselor. I said, a doctor could diagnose your problem. A counselor is going to have to try to figure it out. And I said, that's like going to, that's like a, a guy going to a, a mechanic shop and saying, here's my car, it's broken, why don't you fix it for me? And never telling him what the problem is. And sometimes we do it just like that in our lives. Maybe we go through a struggle, maybe we go through a very difficult obstacle in our life, and we to find anything and everything to help us we'll go to we'll go to psychiatrist and we'll say hey help me with my mental condition we'll go to a doctor and we have physical problems and maybe we're down and we're struggling with things we say please help me with my situation we'll go to friends and ask for advice we'll go to family members and ask for advice we'll go and we'll try to find a way to cure what is bothering us and we never take the opportunity first and foremost go to God think about that the next time you come come with a cold and we're hitting cold, cold and flu season what is going to be the first thing that you reach for is it going to be your Lord is there, or is it going to be the medicine cabinet and see if there's NyQuil in there or at least that's my choice of weapon when it comes for me being sick <laughs> What's going to be the thing that you go for when you have some kind of health issue? Will you not take it to God first? If you believe when he said, let there be light, be light, if that is the same God that has that kind of power, why does he not have the same power to help you in your infirmity? <laughs> I told you there a couple months ago about how playing basketball one more game. I, I, remember that. I remember that very distinctly. Nathan and I and, and my boys were there, and I, he just said, one more game. I was like, all right, one more game. Here I go. I'm limping the next Sunday here. And I can remember going home, and I was like, ah, oh, they just told me I broke my ankle, and, I, and here it's just going to be something miserable. And I, and I told you, I was, I, if there was a horrible example of a, of a grown man acting like a little baby. It was Jay Stevens that day. <laughs> Here I am going to be in crutches. Here I am going to have to sit at the household. Well, that may not be bad, but anyways. Uh, but just it was just a really bad situation. But how great was it the next day? I go to this doctor, and they look through these x-rays and said, Jay, nothing wrong with you. And I don't, I don't chalk that up to this diagnosis. And I don't chalk that up to negligence on the doctor before. I chalk that up to God. And it needs to be chalked up to God. Because it went from something bad to something good. And he does deserve the glory for that. Does he not? Sometimes we got to quit going to the wrong guy and think that he's going to solve all of our problems. We need to go to God because he can solve all our problems. And understand this too, brethren. Sometimes when it comes to going to him for a problem and he doesn't solve it the way you want to, does not necessarily mean he's trying to put something to discourage you and bring you down. Take the opportunity to examine ourselves sometime when it comes to trials or tribulations that go through our life. And sometimes they are masked because there's blessings involved. 
but don't be like this guy. <laughs> and he goes and he thinks that the one's going to save it. And it's almost like he forgets about what that servant girl says. says, go to the prophet. Don't go to the king. The king isn't going to help you. But that prophet of God, he will help you. Remember what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 through 9. And he tells them about how people always look to individuals that's going to say great things. And, and they're going to try to say that they're this great individual God. But when you see there in verse 15, or Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, it says, they honor me with their lips, but I'm really not important to them. I'll use a different translation here. But it says, I'm really not that important to them. Their worship is worthless, and the things that they are teaching are only human rules. It's not about God, it's about them. And if we go to individuals and we think it's about them, then we're worshiping the wrong thing. And we need to go back to God. Now, I hope you don't think I'm trying to follow some false prophet here, but there is times I'll listen to Joe Osteen. He is interesting to listen to and entertain. <laughs> But one of the things I find interesting is there's a thing that they have on XM where people could call in and talk to them. And there is people out there that believe that that's the God that will solve their problems. Or that's the God that has solved their problems. And while he could be a great encouragement, I, I, I'll be honest with you, brethren, the way he is able to open up doors to talk to people is, is fantastic. But does not make him right. <laughs> But unfortunately, just because he is this kind of an encouragement to someone does not mean that's the guy that's going to solve your problems because once a challenge does come along and he's not able to fix it, there's not only going to be a discouragement that he's not going to be able to solve the problem, but that guy's a prophet of God, quote unquote. And he must not be a prophet of God because he's not able to fix my situation in my life. We got to get out of that mindset that people here on earth is going to fix your problems. God has the authority to fix your problems. And that's who we need to turn to. Not turn to Jay, or not turn to Dan when he was here, or turn to the next preacher that comes up here. Turn to God. That's the problem with Naaman. Because he thought that this guy was going to fix everything, and he wasn't able to do anything. And if you follow along in that passage, Naaman hears him throwing a fit about this, and he tells him, he goes, no, tell that guy to come to me, and I'll make sure he's taken care of. The right guy, the prophet of God. <laughs> so as we continue on, just be mindful that he went to the wrong man. But also we can see, too, that he misunderstood the remedy. And, and look how there, and if you continue on the next few verses that he came in kind of like this uh, grand interest, if you will. He Naaman came with his horses and chariots and Elijah stood outside the door and Elijah didn't come, doesn't come to him. He sends a messenger to him and he sends this very simple message. Go and wash in the river Jordan seven times, then your skin will be healed and you will be pure and clean. Simple, right? Well, he didn't get it. And unfortunately, if you follow along with how we see religion today, there is a lot of people that misunderstood the remedies that we need to do today according to Scripture. Think about this. Baptism. Now, I talked about this this morning. I told you I'd talk about it tonight. Baptism is something that is not really denied to anyone if they're willing to follow the steps of God. And it involves just an individual in water. Sure, we'll add some things along to it, change of garments, a baptistry. But here we have brought things out, and what, the reason we did this is because it's something that can be done anywhere Anytime, and anyone is able to do it. And sometimes when it comes to this baptism, some people say, well, that's not salvation. You're right, it's not salvation. 
If salvation was just baptism, people would just be lining up all the time, wouldn't they not? If that was the only thing that we need to do, and unfortunately we have got this mindset uh, in the religious world today that they believe that baptism is the only thing that gets us in God's door. I even remember one show that would say, well, sorry for, because <laughs> she was trying to baptize someone in her swimming pool. She said, sorry for, for me trying to sneak you into heaven. And that's kind of that mindset. It's the idea that we think that that's the only thing we need to do, and it's not. It's just a part. It's just the same idea that people believe that if we just acknowledge that there's a God, say a prayer, and therefore we can be a part of the Lord's church. That's not what God said. That's not what the Holy Spirit has instructed us to do. If you want to follow the guidelines, he has told us in very good, in very great detail what we need to do when it comes to our salvation. But make no mistake, it's not just baptism. And make no mistake, it's not just repentance. And make no mistake, it's not just confession. And make no mistake, it's about, well, I'm just going to live a faithful life for the rest of my life. Or just hear the word or believe in this word. It's more to it than that. And we see that so many mistake the remedy today when it comes to our soul's condition. There used to be a guy down home in Marietta that would stand outside the courthouse in Marietta, Ohio. He did it every Thursday afternoon, and he would proclaim the gospel. But I had to admire his efforts because he went through a lot of ridicule. He let people honk the horn and say very horrible things to him. I have to give him credit for something that he is trying to <laughs> proclaim in this message. But one time after he got done, I stopped him. I want to talk to him. I said, let's talk about some of the things pertaining to our salvation. And one of the things we talked about was baptism. And we, we went on to this discussion for about 10 minutes to where he was trying to explain, if I'm not mistaken, that all we need is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Where'd you get that idea at? There is a part of that in there, but I think he fails to realize who that, was, who that belongs to. And I also think he fails to realize that there was restrictions and uh, duties that apostles had, and there's restrictions and duties that you and I have. And we forget about the importance of what we need to do as Christians because we're too busy looking on the other guy and said, well, he did this. Why can't I do that? God didn't tell me to do it like he did. God told me how I needed to do it. That's why I can't do what the thief on the cross was able to accomplish. That's why I can't get the baptism of the Holy Spirit like the apostles did when it comes to spreading out the message of God to everyone. Don't say that because this individual goes through this, that therefore I have a right to go through that too. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people do just that. They misunderstand the remedy that we need to do for our salvation. Don't be the individual that makes some kind of grand interest and thinks that it should be just the way I want it. Remember what I said last week? This is not Subway. And this is not, what was the other one? Uh, Burger King. <laughs> Our faith is not a restaurant. It's not a fast food restaurant at that. Our faith is entailed in the holy scriptures that is given to us by God. Don't mistake what the remedy is for you and I. Keep in mind also, too, that he wanted a substitute. I highlighted two words here, and you'll see, you'll understand why I put these two words, because it is the same thing that we use all the time when we justify what we need to do. He became angry, and he said, I thought 
Elijah would at least come out and stand in front of me and call in the name of the Lord his God. I thought he would wave his hand over my body and heal my leprosy. And Abana and Puff, or Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, are better than all the water in Israel. Why can't I wash in those rivers of Damascus and become clean? And he was angry and he turned to leave. I thought... That usually what gets us in trouble. Brother, when we go out and proclaim our faith, it should never be, I thought, or I believe. If you ever notice with Jesus Christ, when he is tem tempted by Satan, and when he talks to people that say, well, I don't think that's right, how does he respond? Especially when he talks to Satan. I'll give you all this, all this if you just bow down to me. It is written that you shall serve the Lord your God, and only him you shall serve. It was not why well, I believe in this. No, what God has said, and there is the basis of my faith right here. Because what he has written down in his word, that's what I believe. That's what I thought. It's not, it's not going to be something where... As Peter reminds us, it's not going to be some private interpretation. It's not going to be something that uh, somebody else has a different variation on. This is not something that's going to confuse people. He wants some kind of substitute. And you know, the funny thing about this, I, I read a thing on Bobby Brown and Whitney Houston. And, and Whitney Houston was baptized in the Jordan River. And she says, this, and Bobby Brown said the same thing now, what they said back then. It is dirty. And if you talk to some people today, they will tell you the same thing. That Jordan River, that one that they wanted to be baptized in, that is not a very clean river at all. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> but be mindful that when God tells us to do something, it's not this idea that, well, maybe I could do it somewhere else. And it will be better. And look how, if you look at verse 11, that he thought that he should have some kind of grand entrance. It should be something where Elijah, not his servant, but Elijah should come out here. He should come and maybe even bow before me and wave his hands across me and like, oh, Naaman, you're here. And let us do something grand and wonderful for you before we heal you. And then talk about how wonderful you are. And let's make sure that everything that we do is something that is grand and pleasing before your eyes. And that's the way we do our faith sometimes. I will do something in faith not unless somebody sees me doing it. I'm not going to do something that helps the church not unless we all do it. I'm not going to do something in church not unless we put a lot of money and a lot of effort by everybody to do it. And, and we see that people don't do nothing because they say that it's not something grand. Who cares? <laughs> Brethren, the greatest buildup of my faith has never been something grand. It's been something small. It's been something insignificant. And it's also been done something in secret. <laughs> Those are the things that build up my faith. Because it doesn't need something grand. It doesn't need something that I'll have to write a feel-good story about it on social media. Some of the greatest things that have been done in faith, you have no idea who the originator is. Who decided to pay for your breakfast at the Wendy's drive-thru? Who decided to give you 20 bucks and put it in a car and you have no idea because they didn't put a name on it? You know why they did that? Because they don't care. It's all about God. Well, towards the end, I want to just be mindful that when we do these things, it's not trying to impress someone. No, let it be your Lord, your God. And maybe, just maybe, now, when we do something like this and we do it in secret, 
that maybe someone does it too. Down home, if you if you ever been down Parksburg, they're kind of getting rid of it. I'm a little bit worried because I'll tell you why I did it here in a second. But they have a toll bridge. And it started off 25 cents, now it's 50 cents. You go across it and pay the toll, you just keep going. And Brother Andy Yerby down home from our town, he said, you know what I do? He says, when I drive through that toll bridge, I not only pay for me, but I pay for the guy behind me. 50 cents. Not a big deal at all. But I want you to realize something. It makes somebody's day that somebody thought of them, don't know who they are and don't know who, uh, uh, what their day is like, but 50 cents just to pay their toll just to get through there. Just makes someone's day. It's small. It's not important in the world's eyes, but it's something that makes someone's day. Don't do things that has to be grand. Just do things. Naaman thought that it was something that he should have a spectacle of. And when it came to this particular area, that it should be somewhere where he liked to go. Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, he said, it'd be bad for you teachers of the law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, that you wash clean outside your cups and dishes, but inside you're full of, of what you got by cheating others and pleasing yourselves. And what the mindset was in that religion at that time was, it wasn't about trying to save souls. It was about making a name for themselves. And thinking that was the way for salvation. That was the way to have it, and it wasn't. When we come here, brethren, when God tells us to do something, let's not say to ourselves, well, let's find a substitute that is, diff that is a lot better and a lot more pleasing. You may dab in a body do that. Remember, they were supposed to offer an incense sacrifice to God and decide to change it? Be mindful that a substitute is not what we need. Obedience is what is expected. Keep in mind, too, that he wanted to dictate his own course. I go to Titus for this because keep in mind that the way Damon wanted to do things is how it was Naaman's way or is not at all. And Paul tries to encourage Timothy in his second epistle to him. He says, I give you a command. Christ Jesus is the one who will judge all people. Starting in verse 1. He says, those who are living and those who have died, he is coming again to rule his kingdom. He says, so I give you a command. And the command that he gives Timothy is not something that is just, it's, it's for Timothy, it is something for all of us. Tell everyone God's message. Be ready at all times to do whatever is needed. Tell people what they need to do. Tell them that they are doing wrong and encourage them. And do this with great patience and careful teaching. The time will come when people will not listen to the true teaching, but people will find more and more teachers who please them. And they will find teachers who will say what they want to hear. Do not be the individual that the next preacher has to come up here, that he has to entertain you. Don't let the next song leader that comes and leads your song say, well, I want him to lead this because this is what makes me happy and neglect the opportunity to edify the congregation as a whole. Do not be the person that has to say, if it's not my way, it's no way. 
And don't be the individual that discourages more than, dis than encourages. Be the individual that is going to do God's will and is going to find the best course and the best possibility to bring people to God. And Kim Prager asked a question this morning. He said, what, does God want me to be happy? And I said, yes. He says, explain yourself. I can't. Because I can only tell you what makes Jay happy. And I promise I'm going to talk about the hockey team. See, I even said hockey team. I didn't say the other word. But there's things that makes me happy that won't make you happy. Obviously. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the thing that we miss out on this is when it comes to this course of trying to encourage and build up, sometimes we think that the way I do it is the best way. And it's not. Maybe for you, may not be for Paula. It may be for Harold, but it may not be for Dwight. And we think that because we have this kind of course that it got us to God, does not necessarily mean it brings everybody to God. Well, how do you do that, Jay? It's just like that. I can't tell you. It goes through trial and error. It goes through knowing people. It goes through talking to people. The approaches are different in every, every scenario. And it's because we're all different. <laughs> but Paul is trying to remind us here that, as he says, do this with patience and careful teaching. And be careful because you are fighting against individuals that is going to tell people whatever they want to hear. And that is a challenge to try to persuade, to try to convince, to try to encourage, to try to build up in a way that is pleasing to God comparing to people that don't care as long as you're happy. They didn't want it that way. And there's a reason why he didn't get it the way he wanted. That comes in our next point. Because he thought that it was too simple. Look how in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 15, he tells us, Naaman's servants went to him and talked to him and said, Father, if the prophet told you to do something great, you would do it. Isn't that right? But he said, wash and you will be pure and clean. It is a simple statement that has been given by his messenger. This is what you need to do. Why would you question it? Why do you have to question it? Baptism. Is that, once again, that prime example? Why do I want to go in in a water and, and be submerged in it and then come out and say, this is a part of my salvation? And, and people go into this, want to go into these long, detailed explanations and why we should and sometimes why we shouldn't do it. But here's the simple thing why we should. Because God asked us to. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end. Why? Because in verse 19, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. If he tells us to do something, just do it. I don't know about you, but there's times my kids, I tell them to do something, and they want to go into some long debate on why they should or should not do it. And I tell them this very simply. If I tell you to do something, just do it. <laughs> don't ask why. <laughs> just do it. Michael Jordan made millions of dollars on his three little words. Just do it. And, and people were motivated because he took this idea of basketball and he just went his way and did the things that made him what he was. But Christ is also giving you a message that will get you to what you need to be too. Saved. 
a reward with him in paradise, a reward with him in heaven, a place where there's no pain, no suffering, no tears, no death. He is giving you that, and he says, here's what you need to do. Just do it. And if it's simple, who cares? It doesn't need to be complex. The Lord's Supper does not need to be complex. It does not have to be some seven-course meal and some, uh, some variety of drinks in order to remember him. No, he wants something simple that they all had uh, an ability to possess, to remember what he is doing. You ever notice it doesn't necessarily use unleavened bread? But we all come to the conclusion why we use unleavened bread. Because it was the day of the unleavened bread. And that's what they had. So we make the conclusion we, that that was a part of what we do in the Lord's Supper. Simple, right? So that's why we use this unleavened bread. This is why we use the fruit of the vine. Not grape juice, not wine, but the fruit of the vine. Because it was things that people had access to. The reason why we use water in baptism and to learn the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is very simple because everybody had access to it. Why is it that when we, when we come together and we do music, it is everybody? Why is that? Because everybody has this. They have a voice. And they could use it. And maybe some people will say, well, that doesn't sound very good. Or maybe that's a little bit off key. But God reminds us that in his ears, it is beautiful and it's good. Because you're singing to him. I don't want you to be Pavarotti. I want you to be a child of God. If we sit there and we can listen to children who are just learning words, when we sing songs, they like to sing along with us, and we think, how fantastic. And they don't know even the words, but they can go along with us. And we think that's fantastic. Why would we think any less of anybody else? Just because it was simple doesn't mean it wasn't necessary. God wanted you to be a part of him. And he didn't use complex things for where it was impossible for you to do. Finally, he undertook to pay for his cure. Naaman becomes like a child. His leprosy is cured. And, and we all have those kind of visualizations in our mind what this is like. Just, I always think about like uh, when I'm out there in the sun, I get sunburned, I get a little bit flaky, and it just comes off. That's what I think the, what the leprosy is like. That's just, like I said, it's just me. <laughs> but just, you know, we, we imagine things like that. How simple and how cool would it be to have this kind of disease that really is your death sentence, and when he comes out of that River Jordan, and he goes and he looks at his skin, and it's just as simple as that. It's like it's brand new. And he can't put a price tag on it. He tries. But look how Elijah says to him, the Lord is the one I serve. As surely as he lives, I will not accept any gift. He did accept a gift. <laughs> Just read back to your statement. It's not about money. It's about who was able to do this for you. There's your gift. The Lord is the one I serve. And as surely he lives, I will not accept anything. Because it's about God. Brethren, the next time you do a good deed, keep that in mind. You're not doing it. So somebody could pat you on the back and say, Jay, you did a really good job. All shucks, thank you. <laughs> no. What's the motivation behind this? Because God lives. And the reason I do the things I do is because my Lord lives. 
I'm motivated by that. That's why when there's somebody broke down on the road, I'll stop. That's the reason why when someone wants $5 or a dollar, I'll give it to them. That's why if somebody's having a bad day, I'll send them a text. That's why when somebody's alone and they really need to hear somebody, I'll call. And it's because the Lord is the one I serve. And I need to be a representation of him. We talked this morning about how great is it that we show these things, not because of the physical features that we have. Chuck said that. He goes, it's not about the physical features. He's right. It's not about the things that God looks like. It's about what he has done for you and I. It's about the spirit. It's about this, the soul. And what is the soul is capable of doing? And brethren, do not sell yourself short that you cannot do great things. Surely as the Lord lives, I can do these great things. May I encourage you here tonight, for if there's one here who has not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, as surely as the Lord lives, he is looking for you, and he is giving you an opportunity to be with him. And one of the examples that we have here tonight is through baptism. And remind ourselves why God wants us to be a part of this. It's not a outward, well, it is an outward sign of an inward faith, but it is not this kind of thing that we try to show everybody that we're a part of God. We are trying to show God we're a part of him. And if he tells me to be a part of him through this baptism, I'm going to do it. Because I believe in him. And I'm willing to follow him. And he is my father. So I will do what he asks of me to do. Maybe there's one here that needs to repent of sin. And brethren, we are mindful that uh, from our lesson this morning that people will make mistakes. But what defines us when it comes to our mistakes is if we're willing to change back into this child of God. Remember, Peter tells us that when it comes to those individuals that come to God and then leave away again, he refers to them as dogs returning to their own vomit or sows wallowing in their own mire. It's a very disgusting example, but it brings a very sound point. Where's the logic in going to coming to God and then leaving him forever? There's an opportunity to come back to that time. And that's you here this evening. Take the opportunity to fix these things before it's everlasting too late. Maybe you need to pray about things here this evening. This is one, as uh, many doctors and social media individuals, and we can go on and on with people with these resources, tells us this is a very stressful time of the year. But it does not have to be one where we let the world submit we submit to the world. It's an opportunity for us to maybe be built up by God. And we have an opportunity to do that here tonight. Whatever your needs are, let's try to do it through prayer, through repentance, through baptism. But whatever we can do, let's do it here right now. Won't you come while we stand, while we sing?